Hello, welcome to another Cosmology Talk. This week we have Eichiro Kamatsu, who is a scientific director at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Gaking, and Yuto Minami, who is a postdoc at KEK in Japan. They're talking today about a paper that has a tentative hint of birefringence in the CMB. Birefringence is a term that comes from optical physics, where when light is passed through a crystal, it'll travel at a different speed in different directions, but also there'll be a rotation of the polarization if the light moving through it is polarized. The evidence is very weak. It's 2.4 sigma, so it's nothing more than a raised eyebrow at this point, but it is a very, very exciting raised eyebrow. So that's enough from me. Let's hear from Ekiro and Yuto. Thanks again for having us here today. In the paper we're presenting today, we used a new method that we have developed over the last couple of years to measure a signature of new physics in polarized light of the cosmic microwave background. We specifically look for signature of new physics, which violates the so-called parity symmetry, the symmetry under inversion of spatial coordinates, by applying our method to the Planck legacy data, which was released in 2018, we measure the non-zero amount of parity violation at the statistical significance of 2.4 sigma, so this is nothing more than tantalizing hint. Therefore, we clearly need more statistical significance to confirm this signal, but if confirmed, it would have important implications for the nature of dark matter and or dark energy because either or both of them may violate the parity symmetry. So uh, that's why we're excited because first of all, it is a really the new method that we are quite proud of. The second, unexpectedly, we are finding this uh, non-zero hint of that. So uh, let's see what the uh, future data will tell us. If people are remembering this talk or the paper three or six months from now, and there's only two things that they can remember, what would you want those two things to be? We finally have a method that enables us to measure the specific parity variety in the CMB, which was thought not possible before. And then uh, we have a tantalizing hint which needs to be confirmed. The physics is pretty simple. If you look at this image that was created by Yuto, you have polarization pattern at the last of scattering surface, which will be the left image. And the electromagnetic wave will oscillate in a certain direction because it's polarized. And as Sean said, you know, universe could behave as if we were crystal that's biofringent. So the polarization direction will slightly rotate as the light propagates for 13.8 billion years. And if it rotates, it distorts the polarization pattern. And for cosmologists, I think it's best to say it mixes E and B mode polarization. So it creates non-zero EB correlation that wouldn't exist in a standard model of the universe. Hence detection of that will be automatically in a certain sense, hint for new physics. So there's an angle beta that we measure. That's a rotation angle of the polarization plane. And there you go, it's 2.4 sigma, you know, 0.35 plus minus 0.14 degrees. So I really wanted to emphasize, and Minami Yuto is the real hero. We call this samurai, you know, it's, he's a, real samurai uh, on this. Uh, we have been working on developing the methodology for two years. And then first paper defines the basic idea of methodology in a still idealistic situation, full sky, single frequency. But then we have been steadily eliminating some assumptions about the methodology. Now we have, can use partial sky. We can also use full multi-frequency data. So this third paper is the latest one of which gives you the full complete methodology that we used to analyze Planck data release three and as well as Planck data release four. Now, so ignoring the stretching of wavelengths due to expansion of the universe, right? So uh, the CMB light will look like that uh, as it propagates. But then if the universe behaved as if we were crystal like sapphire, uh, it would make the polarization plane rotate by some amount. And let's measure this. So this cosmic biofringence idea is really neat. And it goes back to Carroll, Sean Carroll. This paper, I think this 1990 paper was Sean Carroll's very, very first <laughs> published work. But then if you look at the cosmology literature, the first place I 
could find this uh, particular coupling between electromagnetic wave and the axion field, like a whatever field that makes universe behave like a crystal, is this Turner and Woodrow. So they wanted to use this term to generate primordial magnetic field. <laughs> but so this came out in completely different context, but the physics is similar. So you have some kind of field here, theta, which is related to axion field. And then uh, if you look at the electromagnetic tensor, this kinetic term is a usual one. It's B squared minus E squared, where B is the usual magnetic field, E is the usual electric field. They have nothing to do with B and E mode polarization at this stage, just regular B and E in electromagnetism. So B is pseudo vector, so it's parity even. E is a vector, so it's parity odd. If you square both, of course, but they're both parity even. However, this Trans-Simons coupling, FF dual, is parity odd. So this is a new term that doesn't exist in the standard model of physics. And the scalar field is a pseudo scalar. So if you flip the uh, coordinate, then it also changes the sign. So uh, this is a particular coupling that motivated Catalan et al. to look for a signature of the parity virus in the universe. Namely, this term, just like a sapphire, this will make the phase velocities of right and left-handed polarization states of photons different. So if the initial incident light was polarized, the polarization direction will be rotated. So, so that's the signature we're looking for. The phi A axion field is, is something that's quite a popular model of dark matter. In dark energy, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this is also implemented to solve the strong CP problem yes. in particle physics. So there's yes. a good reason to think that the phi A is non-zero. Is there a prediction from those models as to the size of the signal that you're measuring should be? And is it smaller or is it comparable to what you'd be measuring? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So uh, yes, the strong CP problem, the notion of that is that this phi, or theta, will be coupled to churn simons term of the strong interaction sector. So let's call that G mu nu, not electromagnetic. But if we have something like that, it's very likely that the same field will couple to the trans simons term of, of electromagnetism. But the mass that you would expect for dark matter of this so-called QCD axiom is pretty large. I mean, it's small compared to WIMPs. So WIMPs mass is at one GeV or so. These QCD axioms are 10 to minus five EV. So it's small, but still large enough compared to the expansion time scale, so that this theta oscillates like crazy over 13.8 billion years. <laughs> so if you plug that theta in this expression, beta is just zero. It just totally cancels out. Yeah, so therefore, if you wanted to use this to probe the parity varying physics of some axial looking field, this theta can't oscillate too much. It could oscillate today, but it shouldn't be oscillating too much for most of the path length of the CME. So which means theta would be something like dark energy. So that was a proposal made by Sean Carroll in 1998. That would be the top right paper there. But you can also have the field that would behave like dark energy early time, then dark matter like late time. So this could be actually related to the so-called Hubble tension, you know, that you probably talked about in the Cosmo talk as well. So all these things are tied together and makes this phenomenon even more interesting. The magnitude of theta in those other models that are kind of trying to explain other things, is that magnitude large enough that we would expect to see it in birefringence or is it not? So it's completely free. I mean, maybe it's not true to say it's completely free, but even for QCD axiom, there are variations for the models. But it suffices to say that the magnitude you need for G to explain our measurement is completely consistent with all the measurements that we have so far in the particle physics experiments. So why we do this? The so universe energy budget is dominated by two dark components. We live in dark ages, blah, 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 all the usual stories. But now people are, I think, quite excited about the possibility that the dark matter and or energy would violate parity. So this axion-like phenomenon is gaining attention once again. I mean, this was quite popular before. Now it's popular once again. But simple motivation, this is, you know, kind of almost like my style. Let's look. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, yeah. 
I don't care. Uh, right. I just wanted to look. Yeah. I'm a big fan of measure everything. We've yeah, been yeah, surprised yeah. so many times in the past when, I don't yeah, know, yeah. suddenly Mercury's perihelion is advancing or suddenly there's a muon that we didn't expect. So yeah, yeah. measuring yeah, yeah, everything yeah. is good. So uh, yeah, I'm glad that you agree <laughs> with this motivation. So CMB, right? Uh, beautiful Planck data, it's polarized. And then to interpret this polarization data, because polarization has directions, we need to somehow decompose them into patterns. And when you look at, for example, here, you have red, blue, red, blue. So that defines the uh, Fourier vector that going in the horizontal direction. Then depending upon how polarization directions are oriented with respect to the direction of the wave vector, you define E and B unambiguously mathematically. And uh, now I have to remind people that this E and B have nothing to do with electromagnetic field. It's just jargon. In fact, it's even more confusing that the E is parity even and the B is parity odd. <laughs> it's quite opposite of electric field and magnetic fields. So E is parity even. So E square power spectrum is also parity even. B parity odd, but B square will be parity even. And TE will be parity even, therefore, other combinations such as TB and EB will be sensitive to the parity variety in physics quite uniquely. So that was the realization that Mark and his collaborators also had. So they proposed that EB correlation would be the great way to probe a cosmic bioinfringence proposal by Sean Carroll. So cosmologists would have seen this beautiful power spectrum plots already. The usual story, the TT from sound wave, E from sound wave, B from lensing, maybe B from gravitational waves. But what's missing here is the EB correlation. So this is something that you haven't seen so much before. And uh, if you have seen this before, uh, people are saying to you that they are all consistent with zero. <laughs> the reason EB is zero due to lensing is that lensing is doing it in a parity even way. So... Ah, good. So that's right. So EB correlation I was referring to now is E at one L correlated with another B at the same L, whereas weak lensing actually converts E at one multiple to B to different multiple. <laughs> so that's why actually B looks like E except uh, no peaks. That's like some kernel of transformation, right? So there's some mixing of E at the same L, won't there? No, 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 there will be no. The reason, reason is the following. So E is modulated by gravitational potential of the lensing. That will give you B. Then there's a, a conservation of angular momentum, namely E at L1 plus gravitational potential at L2, right? L1 plus L2 will give you B at L3. So the conservation of uh, orbital angular momentum, but then in order for L1 and L3 to be equal so that you have EV correlation at the same L, you have to have phi, the gravitational potential at L2 equals zero. Well, that's monopole, but there's no monopole <laughs> in a gravitational potential. It has to be a fluctuating field. So you, there's no way that you can couple uh, E and B at the same L. The best possible case would be maybe L plus minus one, you know, if you had the di dipole lensing, that's also weird. But if you had that, then you can have plus minus one coupling. But more, in most of the cases, the lensing power spectrum peaks at L50. So the mixing is usually plus minus L50. Yeah, so if you then work out how intrinsic E minus B, B model lensing is actually created later time. So it's, it's not completely correct. But if you have this E minus B here, that gets converted into the observed EB correlation. And if you had intrinsic EB, that also gets converted into observed EB, but although if beta is small, it's just one, yeah? So if beta is small, you just have intrinsic EE minus BB times beta gives you observed EB. And because beta is usually tiny, it's a tiny effect. So traditionally, we first have the theoretical model for CMB, E minus BB, and fit that to the observed EB using the best fit in CMB and assuming EB correlation intrinsically vanishes. But then it's a bit unsatisfying because we have to assume a model. So why don't we then massage the equation because EE and BB themselves observed differently if we had 
constant gravity fringes. So that's observed in BB. If you take the difference, it's related to the intrinsic difference in this way. Then if you manipulate the equations, you actually can relate observed EV to the observed E minus BB here. There's a typo here. So you don't have to assume any model. That's nice. But then there's a biggest enemy, which made the previous measurement impossible. So this is what we mitigated in our new method. So that's the impact of miscalculation of detectors. If the polarization was rotated and you have EB mixing, it's tempting to interpret it as cosmic biofringence. But what if there is no cosmic biofringence, universe wasn't a sapphire after all, but you have a detector <laughs> whose orientation of polarization sensitive directions were rotated with respect to the sky coordinates, but we didn't know it. It's okay that it's rotated as long as we knew it so that we can calibrate it. But if we didn't know it, there's no way that we can disentangle this miscalibration angle, which is alpha and beta, that's the constant biofringence. So all we can measure is the sum, alpha plus beta. Then past measurements can be summarized in terms of alpha plus beta, although previous measurements, most of them are presented as a measurement of beta alone. But in reality, it must be interpreted as alpha plus beta. These are all the measurements. So the first measurement was done by Chinese group and then uh, very nice and inspired by that. We also looked at the uh, cosmic array fringes in Dublin map after fifth year, the five year data release, 579, and we had this measurement and so on. And people never stop, right? This is such an exciting science area that uh, people just keep doing this. Now, if you look at these numbers, look, <laughs> why not discover it yet? And, but uh, if you look at closely, they are all over the place, right? That's, something is going on here. Yeah, I mean, that, that SPT one is 10 sigma. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and this is, like a, although it's a three sigma, uh, it's minus sign, so something is going on. So it must be due to alpha, right? Uh, that's the reason why people haven't made a discovery claim yet. So you need to know alpha, and if you knew alpha, you correct it already. So then alpha's best fit value is usually zero that you do your best characterization of the detectors. But then there's an uncertainty in the knowledge of alpha. So that should be added as a systematic error. For example, a pre-flight WMAP characterization had 1.5 degree uncertainty. Quad experiment had half a degree. Planck had a 0.3 degree. So once you add that, suddenly 0.3 degree doesn't seem like significant, right? So this was the major limitation that we mitigate in our paper. All the others actually, uh, there's no estimate of these systematic errors. Therefore, for example, polar bear SPT, what they had done was to use this measurement to calculate alpha, assuming beta is zero. But if you do that, you lose the sensitivity to cosmic biofringence. So the idea was, this cosmic biofringence is proportional to the path length of the photon. So if you look at microwave sky, it's not just CMB. You actually get a lot of emission coming from our Milky Way. Our Milky Way is our backyard. It's right there. So path length is totally negligible compared to the path length of the CMB. So this can't be affected by beta. So if you have foreground emission within our Milky Way, they're all rotated only by alpha, uh, polarization miscalibration angle, and beta and alpha would affect CMB. But the nice thing that we can now inherit from our previous discussion is that we don't have to, however, assume what the foreground power spectrum is because we don't know what that is. But we can, you, you can relate measured difference between E and BB to the uh, measured EB without assuming any model. Do you have to assume that the foreground intrinsic EB is zero? That's coming. That's coming next. Answer is yes and no. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, but we don't ignore it. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Excellent question. Yeah, that will certainly be the central stage of discussion after the publication of paper. But now, okay, that's fine. But we actually do know something about CMB. Yeah. So we actually know pretty well. So let's use our knowledge of the CMB power spectra to disentangle between alpha and beta. So we use measured total power spectrum to get alpha. Then we use CMB knowledge to extract beta. So when you say CMB knowledge, you mean kind of like you fit to the data, you get omega matter spectral index, blah, blah, blah. And therefore you kind of know what the CMB was and then you can yeah. subtract that. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's the best fitting uh, lambda CDN. But no explicit modeling of the foreground E in BB is necessary, except intrinsic EV correlation. Yeah, so what about that? So for our baseline result, so 0.35 plus minus 0.14 degrees, we assume that both intrinsic foreground EV and intrinsic CMBV at the surface of Lasso Sketcher to be zero. And uh, this is you know, justifiable because early universe physics could produce EV correlation, but uh, their shape will be quite different from E minus BV from the sound wave. So if we wanted to simultaneously fit them, we can. So this, that's not the limitation. Foreground EV is a little more tricky, then I'll come back to that later. Primordial EB itself would be non-standard there, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be very exciting, yes. Now we have the model, right? So you observe the EB, is modeled by these two terms. Let's take the difference, square, divide that by the variance, that's your chi-square. And then let's do the parameter estimation by running Markov chain Monte Cairo, estimate alpha and beta. But first we should validate this using simulated data. So this is a simulated data of the futuristic CMB experiments such as Lightbird, but this is nice to illustrate the physics. So when you have, let's say 120 gigahertz channel, or 100 uh, whatever gigahertz channel, which are pretty dominated by CMB, then what you measure really well is alpha plus beta. And alpha is a horizontal axis, beta is the vertical axis, and indeed the eta contour is super degenerate along alpha plus beta constant. But if that was there, this contour wouldn't close. The reason why it's closed is that there's a bit of foreground that breaks the degeneracy between alpha and beta. Therefore, what you have is a situation in which alpha plus beta is precisely determined. But then the knowledge of the alpha that comes from foreground has some big uncertainty. So you break degeneracy, then uncertainty in alpha is essentially the same as uncertainty in beta. Now, as you add more foreground, so as you go to higher frequencies, you dominate more by the dust. So the horizontal area sh shrinks because you have more foreground to use, but you shouldn't overdo it because when you lose CMB, all you measure is alpha and no sensitivity to the beta, right? For example, this 300 gigahertz, it's dominated by dust and you, you don't really measure CMB. In this case, you don't measure alpha plus beta, you only measure alpha. So it's very interesting transition that you have from CMB dominated to dust dominated. And when you do the multi-frequency fit, you take advantage of all this because although alpha can be different at each frequency because each frequency has different detectors, beta must be common. And it's a power spectrum. So you have not only 119 gigahertz cross 119 gigahertz, you have 119 cross 195, blah, blah, blah. So you have this max, you maximized information by doing multi-frequency. So that was a big innovation that we made. And Utah, of course, Samurai uh, played a big role there. I think I'm just asking a slightly annoying question now, but you said beta is the same. That's presumably model dependent, right? Because if there is some sort of birefringence, maybe it's frequency dependent. Maybe the amount of it depends on the wavelength of the light. Uh, okay, that's an excellent point. For Sapphire, that would definitely be the case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the universe, yeah? Uh, if the, uh, hmm, I think that's a research paper. Uh, I don't <laughs> know if anyone, yeah? Sean. <laughs> I think I mean, that's an accident, no? Uh, certainly, I mean, you'd yeah. still discover something super interesting <laughs> if you made the assumption yeah. that beta was frequency independent. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. But it doesn't necessarily have to be, I guess. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. Sure, indeed. Yeah, I think you are right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I kind of like the idea of someone having to cite a cosmology talk. I mean, you're making these cosmotalks available, therefore you are yeah. essentially offering new ideas for free, no? Yeah, so that's, yeah. <laughs> so uh, maybe maybe somebody will be on, on, onto it already. Yeah. So just necessary detail for experts to make our work credible. So we use four polarized high frequency Planck data to eliminate noise correlations of the detectors. We measure only correlations between so-called half emission splits, and then we mask the, our sky to avoid very bright carbon monoxide regions, which are known to produce problems, and then bright point sources and bad pixels, which are not observed. 
And then also there's something called I2P leakage, namely you think you're measuring polarization, but it's actually coming from the detector non-ideality. Therefore you measure unpolarized light intensity I, which leaks into your polarization measurement. I2P leakage is a very uh, technical thing, important to correct, we corrected it. But even if we didn't correct it, the result didn't change. So that was good news. And I think our measurements are quite robust against it. Okay, important uh, detail for experts. This is our mask. And then we validate this using uh, a fully blown Planck team's simulations. These simulations don't include alpha or beta. So uh, they all should be zero. And their foreground treatment is not completely consistent with the data sets, so we don't include the foreground. So we are really looking for instrumental systematics that would affect determination of alpha or beta. And then measurements all consistent with zero, which means we don't know any instrumental effect known to produce uh, alpha or beta. So test has passed. Here's the main results. So let's say we first assume that the Planck detectors are all perfectly calibrated. So no miscalibration angle. They will recover uh, what Planck team has found. So this is 0.29 plus minus 0.05. That's essentially uh, perfectly consistent with Planck team found, ignoring this alpha systematic error. So this means that the UTOS code works. At least there's no obvious bug. The statistical chances of Yuto and Planck making the same mistake are, are small. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> That's right. But then when we let alpha free, so we have a simultaneous determination, then alpha goes up, alpha also goes up because now our knowledge of alpha is determined by foreground signal to noise and alphas, alphas are all the same, comparable to this uncertainty here as promised. Beautiful thing, I think, is Planck detectors are calibrated very well. I mean, they're all consistent with zero to within a statistical uncertainty. Here you have two sigma hint for miscalibration, but this number perfectly consistent with the systematic uncertainty that they had in the pre-flight calibration. So all, all consistent. But of course, you know, we can't stop here. Although it's 2.4 sigma, it's always good to peace of mind try to look for it by eyes because <laughs> we trust eyes. Yeah. And I think here's the thing. Uh, so you have E minus B yeah, measured. That's black data points. Now if you use your knowledge of lambda CDM to predict what the CMB, E minus BB should be, and that's blue. This blue would be then rotated by alpha and beta, but this total, the foreground, the difference between black and blue is a foreground. And this is rotated only by alpha. So what you should now expect is the following. When you see EB that looks more like black minus blue, namely you have more signal coming at low multiples, that's most likely alpha. And if you didn't see it, alpha is small. If you see on the other hand, oscillatory feature that resembles the acoustic oscillation in EB, well, that's alpha plus beta. But if alpha was constrained to be small by lack of this blowing up at low multiples, then it's most likely beta. So let's do it. It's 2.4 sigma, so don't expect anything dramatic, right? <laughs> so it's noisy data. First of all, okay, this red is the component that can be attributed to alpha. Blue is a component that's attributed to beta. And as promised, you see a blow up at low multiples. The fact that this blow up is mild, right? Not like going crazy, limits this positive signal to be plus 0.07. And then here negative, right? But not crazy negative, it's a slightly negative limits the angle to be minus 0.07. If this was 0.35, it would be five times more that we don't see. But then the 0.35 is blue. And you know, I mean, frankly, I see something here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, it's easy to see patterns once you've been primed for it. But I mean, the, the data does find a two sigma effect. So there is a two sigma effect to see in there. That's right. I mean, if you worked on BAO, no? you know, if you know where the peaks are, you see it. So. <laughs> I mean, it's important to do it in this order, right? Like you do the data analysis blind and then you look 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. So I think this also suggests that there's no obvious bug in Utah's code either. <laughs> so this, uh, so this is like an important cross sanity check. And uh, yeah, so what about foreground? So here's the thing, okay. If there was an intrinsic foreground EV, it would give you something like this signal, right? Let's say positive signal, which you then misinterpret as a polarization miscalculation angle. If there was positive foreground EV, we would interpret it as positive alpha. And is that because the foreground is just larger on large scales than small scales? That's right, yeah. So therefore, even if there was no miscalculation angle, we would misinterpret it and say we have positive alpha. What we think is alpha is actually the sum of actual alpha and intrinsic foreground contribution. And sign of that gamma, the new angle, is the same as the sign of the foreground EV. So positive EV foreground is the positive gamma. So now from foreground, we suddenly have the situation in which we measure alpha plus gamma, not just alpha. And for CMB, we still measure alpha speeder. If you take the difference, we actually measure, therefore, beta minus gamma. If then, if the sign of gamma is negative, we can totally explain this by the foreground EB. That's a possibility. But there's an interesting finding from Planck collaboration. If you look at completely dust-dominated channel, 353 gigahertz, no CMB, they find evidence for TE and TB correlations, non-zero correlations from dust. They haven't found yet non-zero EB, but uh, TE and TB are definitely there. And they're both positive. So it's not guaranteed that EB dust is positive, but it's likely. We cannot exclude the possibility that EV dust is negative, but evidence suggests that EV dust is positive. If that's the case, our measurement is actually lower than. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the kind of um, Occam's razor Bayesian prior argument would make one expect that it's more likely that EB is negative than that the universe is violating parity. Yeah, but, but this is definitely that something we need to look. We don't really understand why TB does is positive either. So I think some theoretical work is necessary. Assuming that there is no parity violation in the universe, there's a high chance that your measurement is a pure statistical fluctuation because, you know, 2.4 sigma will happen, I don't know, one in 50 times or something. But I was going to ask, if it turns out to be a systematic error, what is your like bet of the most probable systematic? And is the answer this EB dust being of what a 0.25 and negative, or is there something else you might think is the most probable systematic? We are not in the Planck collaboration. So we're now working with Planck collaboration to test this further, but uh, Planck polarization data at low multiples are known to have systematic errors. So that might leak into some of our measurement. So now they have new data processing, suppressing systematics at low multiples. That's Planck data release four. So we're working with them to see if we find anything different. So implications, when dark energy or dark matter couple this way, then you are looking at, you know, coupling constant times the field difference, both of which are really not known, completely model dependent. But here we go, we are measurement and uh, I let theorists chew on it <laughs> and then see what that means for their model. Uh, 2.4 sigma is, is easily enough for uh, theorists to go crazy. <laughs> That's right. I know. Yes. <laughs> if WMAP non-Gaussianity is anything to go by, uh, <laughs> there'll be yeah, thousands yeah, of yeah, papers yeah, with yeah, it in yeah, a few yeah. months. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> a whole industry. <laughs> so Yuto's background is a particle experiment. Yuto was doing a, a experiment for Atlas. So he's a Higgs guy, right? So, uh, so he knows certainly what the 2.4 sigma means. I know also what the 2.4 sigma means because I've spent, as Sean, you said uh, quite uh, correctly, I spent most of my career worrying about 2.4 sigma, FNL. Yeah, I know what that means. And in my former PhD advisor, David Spurgel at Princeton often said, so he gets many phone calls from media, news media and journalists asking him for comments on some tantalizing hint of everything, uh, changing the world, the end of the world, blah, blah, blah. 
And David is a very nice guy. Uh, he, you know, he doesn't want to be rude. He doesn't want to piss off people. He also doesn't want to run into the risk of saying it's wrong or it's bullshit only to then know that it's actually right so that he looks like an idiot, right? He doesn't run that kind of risk. So he says, HRO, you know, the, most, the best way to answer that question of the journalist is it's important if true. <laughs> and you, you look at quotes of David everywhere, New, New York Times, Washington Post, he always says this. So we know, of course, that the higher statistical significance is needed. But we are really proud, you know, I'm really proud of you, Toh, uh, that our new method finally allows to make this impossible measurement, right? It was completely hampered by miscalibration angle, which we completely mitigate now. And our method, our result could be refuted anytime now, from now on, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. How would it be refuted so soon? Because we have ACT data, we have SPT data, we have bicep kick data, we have polar bear data, we have class data, we have spider data, all of which can do this today. Yeah, and all of which would have a different alpha, I guess. Yeah, but then they can all use our method to mitigate that. And also, a Planck is a full sky, but they are, all the other emissions are all partial skies. They look at foreground in a very different way. So if there's an intrinsic EV foreground, they will appear completely differently on those experiments. Yeah, it's interesting because your paper pointing out this myth is already public. Maybe they just haven't done it yet. And once you've published this paper, they will do it. Oh, yeah, they, they're busy, you know? Uh, so they, they need to hear something like this <laughs> to implement somebody else's method. So if confirmed, it would have important implications for dark matter and or dark energy. In the meantime, we are also doing our own measurements using um, a new Planck processing and uh, other public CMB data sets. I mean, we means, of course, Yuto, right? So he's a samurai. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to make my own reflection on what 2.4 sigma means. I think not all 2.4 sigmas are equal, not all three sigmas are equal, not all five sigmas are equal, because there's this thing that everyone's familiar with called the look elsewhere effect. And I think three sigma fluctuations in particle physics go away 99 times out of 100 because you've got a huge look elsewhere effect because you've got a bunch of channels and you can have an excess in channel one or channel two or channel three or channel four. And if you get a three sigma excess in channel 74, it's no big deal. And, and the same can happen in cosmology. If like things like the hot spot and the cold spot and the CMB and stuff, there's, there's lots and lots of lots of things people might look at before they look for a hot spot or a cold spot. I liken it to something like the H naught tension. There's very small look elsewhere effect there, right? There's like five or six fundamental parameters to lambda CDM. So you've only got to look elsewhere effect of about six there. Like they're the first things you would look at before you look elsewhere. And I think this one here lies somewhere in the middle. It's not that you've like looked at a hundred channels and found one 2.4 sigma excess. However, it is a parameter that is not like one of the first five or six that someone's going to look at. So I think that the look elsewhere effect here is relatively small so that the 2.4 sigma is relatively interesting. Yeah, and in fact, this is probably, it's fair to say that it's the only parameter that's interesting in EB, because people haven't looked at the EB. Uh, mm. People look at the EB only for the consistency checks of the data sets. So there's no look elsewhere effect there because there's no other parameter to extract from EB, yeah. So if you look at TT in EE in BB, they all depend on six parameters and whatnot, and you can look for anomalous signal, right? Mm. L of 23, the dip there, yeah, yeah, yeah. first peak, the dip there, right? that's totally looks elsewhere, but that's not happening here because it's EB. Uh, we didn't fit for any features by hand. The theoretical template is given already from EE measurement. Everything's fixed, yeah, so. I think there's still a small look elsewhere effect just in types of new physics space. There's lots and lots of potential new physics. And if you look for a hundred of them, maybe one of them will have a three sigma effect. About comparison with Planck data, so I think our method also says that we don't need foreground removal to measure cosmic biofringence beforehand. I think that is one of the good <laughs> suggestions. What comes next? So what's coming next would be new generation of experiments, so SPT upgrades, right, uh, 3G, and then Simon's Array, an upgrade polar bear, yet another upgrade plus act will be Simon's Observatory. Then, then all combined with CMS4. And we have Lightbird satellite mission that's coming at the same time frame. So up, we can keep testing this over the next at least 10 to 15 years. So yeah, lots are coming. And uh, 
it's good uh, unless it disappears next year. <laughs> right. uh, I think uh, we have we have excellent future prospects in this field. And what what is the ten years from now? What will the sigma be? Uh, <laughs> Ah, okay. So if 0.35 persist, it should at least be four sigma. So the, the very last question that I ask everyone outside of your own research, what do you think is the most interesting thing in cosmology at the moment? I think the searching for axion-like particle with cosmology data is very interesting uh, these days, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, for me, I don't know if it's the most exciting thing in cosmology today, but my life's goal is to really have the definitive evidence for inflation. So we, we worked a lot on finding a non-scale invariant scalar power spectrum from CMB. So NS is less than one at more than five sigma now. So we're quite proud of that. The next step and Gaussianity, right? That's also quite good. But uh, next, next milestone would be the B model polarization from gravitational waves. I don't know if that's the most exciting thing, but for me, that would be the, the next goal. Sure, yeah. I think the, the hype when we all thought BICEP2 had, uh, had detected it shows that everyone else yeah, thinks yeah. it's exciting too. Yeah, Yeah. so nice thing is that while people are excited about this and build experiments for this, we can piggyback on it to measure biofringes as well, right? So we don't have to build anything specifically for biofringes, it just comes. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like this, please do subscribe and click the bell if you wanna be notified and click like to help with the YouTube algorithms and share the channel with your colleagues. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment. I'll make sure that yeah, Chiro and Yuto see it. While you're here, you should watch another video. Maybe there was a talk quite a while ago by Yurik Bauer on um, how axion-like particles might be detected by um, 21 centimeter radiation. So I'll suggest that one. And thanks again, Chiro and Yuto for the great talk. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was fun. Thank you.